I'm going to be talking to you all today about ecosystem goods and services. And I put a little disclaimer, so I'm trained as an engineer, so I maybe have a different take on ecosystem services. But really, I think um, ecosystem services really are an, an interdisciplinary concept. And so I think we need all sorts of different thought processes working around, um, working around ecosystem services and how to um, better provide the capacity of our global ecosystems to continue providing them. So I'm going to start with what I hope you'll get out of this today. And if you're not already aware, I really hope that you take away some sense of the, the critical importance of ecosystem services to us as humans. Okay? Um, as well as that, I'd like you to be able to communicate why we rely on ecosystem services and, and to some extent see how we can't just substitute for them through our own um, technological prowess, so to say. And then finally, I'd like to give you some examples of um, how ecosystem services apply in our day-to-day -day living and then how you and your future careers as um, perhaps you're involved in some sort of um, ecosystem management or, or design as an engineer or um, designer in that capacity, um, but to really approach the different problems that you encounter with an ecosystem services mindset and desire to look for opportunities to have um, multi-functions um, in the types of systems that, we're, that you're designing or that we're living in. So just an overview of what I'll be talking about to, to hopefully get to those takeaways is just uh, to run through what ecosystem services are and why they matter to us. A little bit, I think anytime we talk about ecosystem services, we often find ourselves talking about how we can value them. So I'll talk a little bit about valuation of ecosystem services. And then finally, I'm going to give kind of my perspective as an engineer and how I've um, utilized ecosystem services and some of the work that I have done so far. OK, so when we think about ecosystems. You can, OK, close your eyes. You can think about some ecosystems. There's, we have a lot of different ones, right? So here's some pictures. We've got wetlands, we've got forests, we've got deserts, we've got marine systems. Um, those are some very natural types of ecosystems that we think about. But we've also got, um, maybe you call them semi-natural or some rather intensively managed ecosystems. So we've got um, our croplands, um, maybe grasslands if we're, if we're grazing it intensively, um, and even urban ecosystems. Do you, do you all think of where we are right now? We're, we're an ecosystem, right? So we can't pull ourselves out of this, but we as humans are um, intricately involved in, in part of these systems. Um, an ecosystem is, by definition, the, the interacting biotic and abiotic components, and they're, they're interacting together, so they are a system. Um, and, and each of these ecosystems is characterized by um, different, different functions that it's performing, a different structure, um, different processes that are taking place, and these are all being driven by both the living and the non-living parts in there. And so we can study those things, we can measure those things, and that's what ecologists have done for a very long time, just talking about how to characterize these different ecosystems. When we talk about ecosystem services, we're then kind of bringing ourselves as the humans more into the picture and thinking about what do these ecosystems give to us? What, how do they benefit us um, directly? And so that's really um, what ecosystem services are, is the benefits that ecosystems provide to us. And this is just a small list because there is a countless number of ecosystem services. There's many that we, we understand and we can immediately think of, um, such as, well, ecosystems provide us food and water and raw materials for the, the things that we build. Um, they moderate weather extremes in their, in their effects. We have, um, they're regulating the, the, our air and the water quality, um, maintaining genetic diversity, and we use a lot of those genetic materials um, in you know, everything from pharmaceuticals um, to um, the, the plants we grow and, and, and all of these things going on. So there's a lot of benefits that we get out of ecosystems. Some of them, again, we see very directly in our lives. Some of them maybe we don't think about um, as often, like maybe we're not thinking about um, the microbial uh, s ecosystems that we've got going on in our soil that are, are um, cycling through um, nutrients and, and leading up through the decomposition processes. But those are all very important to us in our day-to-day -day lives. So one of kind of, we'll call this a, a seminal report on ecosystem services was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that was put out oh, about a decade ago, really. 
Um, and it took all those different ecosystem services and lumped them into some general groups, just to, those we people, we like, to, we like to categorize things, right? So we've got provisioning services, so that's thinking again about food, water, um, those sorts of things, raw materials. Regulating services, so there we're thinking more about regulating, say, nutrient cycles that are contributing to water quality or um, global climate cycles that are contributing to um, climate regulation. Um, even microclimate by providing shade and those sorts of things, those are all regulating services. Cultural services, so these are some of the things like uh, recreation or aesthetic appeal, some of these different things that we get out of, um, out of ecosystems for our own um, social types of benefits. And then finally, supporting services. So these are some of those ecosystem services that are maybe a little bit more in the background that we don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but are very necessary to support the provision of all of these other ecosystem services as supporting services. That's, the name would imply that they're necessary for support. And so this, wasn't, this certainly wasn't the first time that we th were thinking about ecosystem services. I think the, the term was coined maybe in, in the 70s, and then even the Greek philosophers were very aware of, of our dependence on these naturally functioning ecosystems to provide us with these benefits. But this is really when kind of the general public started um, paying more attention to our um, ecosystem services. One of the things that this report laid out really nicely, why we should pay attention to ecosystem services, is that our health and well-being is inextricably linked to the provision of these services. And so this is just a figure to, to give some sort of illustration, but we can see that um, certainly in terms of provisioning services, and you can see by the, the width of the arrows and their color, that were kind of the strength of these associations, but certainly every aspect, our health, our, our basic material for good life, security, these are all dependent on provisioning services as well as regulating services, and then um, cultural services as well, all contributing to um, our well-being. And then of course our supporting services, giving us the, the basis for all of these other ecosystem services. So some people decided well, we're not, we're not going to stop there. We're not just going to acknowledge that our health and well-being um, relies on these services. But there's actually been a group of folks who've been working to basically monetize these services. And so, well, first off, we, why would we monetize them? Some of these things, there are some arguments that we shouldn't because, you know, how can we put a dollar value on, um, on biodiversity or, or some of these sort of intangible services that we're getting out of ecosystems? But really, it's, it's a pretty powerful statement if you are able to say, this is a value based in, in, in some way of our, of our economic system that we can better appreciate um, these benefits and really um, what the magnitude of these services to our day-to-day -day life. And so, um, Costanza, there's a group um, out of, um, I think, well, yeah, they've, done, they've done a lot of work in this ecosystem valuation realm. And they've actually looked at all these different types of ecosystems. So you can see um, wetlands really are a pretty heavy hitter in terms of the services they provide to us in terms of um, regulating water quality, floods, providing um, habitat for a lot of our fisheries. Um, so very important ecosystem. Um, as well as, well, of course, all the rest of them are very important. But you can kind of get an idea of some of the, um, the magnitude of the values. Costanza's group then went to say, well, if we look at over the whole world, how much this is worth on a yearly basis, it's $145 trillion, plus or minus a few trillion, right? We don't know exactly. But needless to say, this is way, far, far exceeds the global GDP, okay? Just an example, so it's kind of, I don't know, a little bit... It's a huge number, pretty big to think on a, a global scale. Let's maybe think about a very important ecosystem here in Kansas that we can all relate to. So if you think about the grassland, the prairie, the tall grass prairie, which is kind of where we are here in Manhattan in the, the prairie ecoregion, what sorts of ecosystem services can you, can you envision this, this landscape providing to us? And you can think about it in your mind if you like. There have, there's been a lot of research, of course, out on Kanza Prairie, and one of the um, research groups here, Walter Dodds, has actually looked at 
try to, to put a dollar value on some of these different, the services we get out of a, just a grassland ecosystem. So if you think about, we have some regulating services, right? Global climate, so we're really regulating our um, greenhouse gases with the vegetation in the system. Um, disturbances, so again, we've got climate disturbances, we've got um, perhaps flooding, that sort of mitigation. Um, water, nutrients, soil erosion control, um, pretty big for Kansas is ag commodities, right? This is the grasses are supporting our, our beef industry and some of um, our other our animal production units. Um, biodiversity provides a lot of regulating surfaces out of the biodiversity, so such as um, pest control and things like that. Um, and then, of course, recreation. So we've got just enjoying going for a hike. From that, everything to um, hunting grassland species. And so even, even here, thinking about grasslands, huge contribution in terms of what we, how we could possibly value that if we we're trying to think of that um, in terms of a monetary value. So even though we can say pretty, pretty confidently that we need ecosystem services for our health and well-being, that we can uh, assign maybe some sort of value to them and we can comprehend their worth, um, we're still losing or the capacity to provide ecosystem services, so our natural ecosystems are being degraded in some way. Um, and so in a, a large driver of this is, is land use change. And so one example you can all think of um, would be, for instance, if you've got a forest and it slowly becomes a, a suburban neighborhood. Um, that's maybe not quite the scale of some of our other land use changes. So we've got, um, in terms of you know, feeding our, our growing population, we have a lot of conversion um, of natural ecosystems into more intensively managed agricultural ecosystems, which is changing the provisioning of services. Um, of course, we have suburban and we have also mega cities developing. So we've got a lot of land use changes and a lot of, with that, change in the capacity to pro continue providing services. One of the benefits of um, putting a monetary value is that it can help to drive policy. So even in the midst of land use change, we can still have some way to sensibly try to look at one alternative versus another that may, may include how we choose to manage these ecosystems and, and the services that they're providing to us. So one of probably um, a really nice example that's, um, and some of you may be familiar with this as it's mentioned quite a lot, is um, looking at the, the water supply for the city of New York. So in this figure, the kind of little orange blob down there is um, the New York City area. And their water, believe it or not, comes upstream from away from the Catskill Mountains. And historically, the water has been of such a of, of high quality that the, the treatment that they have to give it at the treatment plant is quite minimal, OK? So you, you can imagine us here in Manhattan, we're pulling our water out of the Kansas River. We've got, you know, we've got plenty to take out. We're spending a lot of money treating the water. Well, fortunately for the city of New York, they've got this a natural ecosystem that's providing some filtration, some um, um, nutrient cycling and, and keeping, so keeping the nutrients low, low contaminants, all that good stuff. Well, due to some land use change that's been occurring over the years, so you see this is beautiful. People want to go there and to build their, their summer home and put in their septic system and, and these sorts of things. Their water quality started declining, okay? So we were losing, the, the ecosystem didn't have the capacity to treat all of the nutrients coming from the septic systems or the bacteria and that sort of thing. And so the EPA comes in and says, well, if you're going to continue serving this water to your, um, to your citizenry, then you need to upgrade your treatment plant. And so, by the numbers, the city of New York considered their, their treatment plant costs. As you can see, six billion plus something like 300 million <coughs> operating manually, annually. So um, not an inexpensive way to go about essentially trying to replace the ecosystem services in, in terms of the water supply that that watershed was providing to them. Or they could purchase some land or put it in conservation easements or essentially um, not allow people to continue building summer homes and such in the watershed. And they could do that instead and still maintain the ecosystem service that that watershed had been providing previously. And so, can you guess which one they did? Yes, right, because we're, we're sensible people most of the time. And so, <laughs> that's not a fair statement probably, but in this case, when the economics are so clear, it's pretty easy to go with um, 
the, eco the Natural Ecosystem Service, okay. All right. This is not to say, though, that we always have to think about technology, so our, our expensive water treatment plant being at odds or headbutting against um, our ecosystem services that can be provided by a natural ecosystem. In fact, sometimes our technologies can actually encourage or promote um, the use of ecosystem or pr <laughs> promoting ecosystem services. So just kind of an example um, from here in Kansas, this is, um, well, Wichita, I don't know if you are familiar with this. It's a very nice, very nice picture. So we've got lots of aesthetic and cultural ecosystem services being provided here um, at the confluence of the, the Arkansas and the Little Arkansas Rivers. Well, Wichita is a large city, right? So like 300,000 plus people. And it's also on the, the water limited side, okay? So we don't get a lot of rain. So Wichita has to get a little creative when it comes to managing their water supply. So what they do is they, they try to um, enhance the uh, ecosystem service that, um, that would be naturally provided in terms of groundwater recharge. And so what they do is they pull water out of the Little Arkansas River and inject it into the groundwater. Okay, So they've got this big treatment plant that's just upstream from the city, and they're pulling out water from the Little Ark when we've got floods, and then they're treating it. Because if you notice in this watershed, we've got the city of Wichita, and up above it, we've got a lot of agricultural land uses. And to manage a lot of our agricultural areas, we use um, pesticides, herbicides, that sort of thing. And then we've got a lot of sediment, some stream bank erosion going on. So they have to remove sediment and atrazine and some other fun things. Okay. So essentially what we're doing is we're substituting a lot of technology here to get that water supply service. And it's very expensive. As a result, the city is actually very motivated to work with landowners upstream to put in different conservation practices, so to try to manage their landscapes to provide erosion regulating services, for instance, or nutrient recycling um, types of services and, and better um, buffers to provide some filtration for some of the chemicals. And so in this case, you can see where even though we've, we've got some of this, we've got a mix of um, the natural ecosystem service, the technology providing ultimately this water supply service. And so, so they can, you can find um, cases where, where it's advantageous to promote the, the natural ecosystem service provision. Really what we've been doing with these examples is both um, Wichita and in New York is we can, we can assess the trade-offs, right? So in the case of New York, we can, we can develop that ecosystem and maybe we get some more cultural benefits out of that because now we're in the Catskill Mountains and we can, we can go hiking and, and just see the views. Um, but the trade-off, of course, is the, the loss of some of those important regulating services. That's where this valuation concept has come in, in, to come in handy because it allows us to better assess what those trade-offs are and decide whether or not we, we really want to, to lose one ecosystem service or, or a whole bunch of ecosystem services for the sake of another. Okay. But it's, it gets tricky, right, to, to evaluate some of these services, particularly within our market structure, because we, um, we have a very good grasp on how to value, say, things that are um, these uh, provisioning services that we are accustomed to paying for in our market. But if we've got services otherwise, we can still attempt to put a value on them. So I'm just going to kind of give you an example of how, how that is done. So for instance, if we think about some different cultural services, so well, something that we have a lot of around here is um, recreation in terms of hunting, bird watching, and, and those industries. And you can essentially still come up with the value for that based on how much people pay. So this is what they actually pay. You could even ask the question as how much are you willing to pay to be able to go out and to fish in this stream or to hunt this particular bird. And if the ecosystem service were not there to support that, then then you have a trade-off, or you can assess if you need to, to do some management differently to promote that service. It becomes, um, yes, let's see here. Recreation and, uh, and hunting, those sorts of things, are not the only types of cultural services we can value. We can also think about aesthetics. This is an example from an urban ecosystem that's not really high on, in terms of ecosystem service provision. This is a detention basin. 
This is a wetland. They're both kind of doing the same thing in terms of providing some service for um, flood regulation. But if you ask, in terms of an aesthetic value, you can ask people around there, well, how much would you pay to live there versus there? Or you can look at home prices. Um, this is an, a hedonic pricing method. But you can see that people are actually willing to pay more to live in a pretty place. And so again, we've got kind of this um, incentive or to show us how people value or, and really do value ecosystem services. But even though we've got some economists, they're called ecological economists, that are working very hard to try to um, put ecosystem services into some sort of term that we can then compare, really not apples and apples, but have some way of comparing um, one land use decision versus another, we're still a long ways from really being able to, to put this together. Um, so because even if we can put a dollar value on things, we're still in a system where we're, we're very motivated to do things um, that benefit us today and maybe not thinking as much about tomorrow. Um, this really comes out in some of our intensively managed ecosystems. So if you think about, uh, for instance, let's, let's think about um, perhaps palm oil um, farming in, in rainforest. It's become, particularly now that we here decide that we don't want trans fats in our foods, now um, palm oil business is exploding, okay, because it's not a trans fat, but it, it works very nicely in our foods as a trans fat used to. And so, so we can have one option, which is to clear cut rainforest and to, to plant palm oil uh, trees. And, and it's still, that is an ecosystem service, right? It's providing food and it is probably sequestering some carbon and doing a little bit of other things. But the ecosystem that it replaced probably had far more, a far greater wealth of, of ecosystem services, okay? And it's, and it's not to say that, um, that we can't do both, because actually they've been looking and say, well, there are places where it's actually, you come out ahead in terms of your ecosystem services if you plant palm oil, for example, um, on a, an area that was previously deforested that is now um, kind of a, a degraded grassland plant palm oil there and, and you get the services you want, but you can preserve some of the other areas where you could have more services. But it takes a little work to, to try to figure these things out and how to um, get to a more um, optimal mix of ecosystem services versus just um, managing everything for one. That's, what, that's another thing we like to do um, as people. We like to <laughs> manage ecosystems to optimize one thing because that's the easiest thing to do really. And so with that idea in mind, I want to talk a little bit about um, an example from, that I'm familiar with that um, I've spent some time studying. And that is management of um, stormwater in urban ecosystems. And we typically do that with the idea of optimizing one ecosystem service, or at least in the past we have. And that ecosystem service has been flood control. And I wouldn't really say that we've gone about it in an ecosystem-based way. We've just said, well, we'll replace all of those um, nice sinuous channels and their vegetation that's rough and you know, causes higher flood stages. And we can just replace it with pipes and um, storm sewers and, and line channels because then we can really control flooding. So the idea for stormwater in urban ecosystems was to put it in a pipe and get it away as quickly as possible so that we didn't have flooding. Um, so that, well, there's one thing, but we ended up with some other issues. So we can think about, we got our flood control services in, in a very localized spot, but then we ended up blowing out urban streams because we no longer have the flow regulation. Um, we're losing our, our ability to control sediment in these types of systems. Um, we also started noticing that we couldn't swim in the water around urban areas because we were um, losing the nutrient control and really the bacterial. Um, processes that were there to, to control bacteria, that our water quality started decreasing. Okay, so we, we started out controlling stormwater. We, we didn't, we weren't thinking about other ecosystem services. So then in about the 90s, we did. We said, okay, well, we, we can still think about flooding, but now we'll try to improve water quality because we don't like having these signs up that say we can't go swimming in the beaches because it just rained and we washed a bunch of um, E. coli into the creek. So 
the solution, back to our, our detention basin, we said, well, okay, we can control flooding because we'll, we'll, we'll hold back the water in this thing, and then when it's sitting in there, the, some of the, the, the sediment will settle out and will slow down the velocity so we won't blow out the streams. And so we thought we had things figured out. Sometimes we have these with water in them, so then this is a, a pond. Again, so kind of, uh, the, well, these are, these are ecosystems, right? Maybe they're not high-functioning ecosystems, but the idea was that they would at least provide flood control and wat some water quality services. And so we did this for a while, and some places have done it a lot. So this is North Carolina. If you looked at a, um, an aerial over Wichita or some other cities here, you would find the same kind of picture, a lot of ponds. But this approach still didn't really improve the situation in terms of um, the capacity of our ur urban ecosystems to provide multiple services. So we still had trouble with our streams, and we still had um, low quality receiving waters. So then, about a decade later of, of kind of realizing we are failing here, we decided, well, we need more, we need more ecosystem services. So we need our, our stormwater management plans to provide more services. And so we really started thinking about infiltration and recharge, so this being part of that hydrologic regulating type of service that um, natural ecosystems are providing to us. And so we came up with some new ways to do this. So um, we had the detention basins and ponds. We said, that's not really good enough, so let's think about some more functional ecosystem-based stormwater controls. So we brought in rain gardens or bioretention, the main difference being if you are an engineer selling this to a client, you should call it bioretention so you can make more money. But basically, they're the same thing. It's just a, a soil system that's receiving runoff from an area, and as it moves to the soil, it's being filtered, it's being infiltrated, so you've got the water quality, the, the nutrient cycling, um, and the big picture hydrologic regulation going on there. We also got constructed wetlands. So we took a pond, made it shallower, and planted some vegetation. So we get um, some a little more activity in terms of the nutrient cycling, some better water quality, and, and hopefully some biodiversity happening there. Also have green roofs, um, and there's a number of others, but those are just some of the most um, common. And really, when we made, started making this shift, we realized that we, it's not to our benefit to just design a system that is, maximizes a single service, but rather we need to think about a, multi, a multifunctional system or a multifunctional approach um, in an urban ecosystem. Um, with this, we also kind of started bringing, thinking more, um, trying to think more like an ecologist. So thinking about systems that could organize themselves, that being if, if you have a, a large flood um, and you have, let's say you have an undersized concrete structure then, your concrete blows out and you no longer have function. But if you have, say, a wetland, maybe your plants get flooded out, but then you know, they're a living system. They know how to rearrange themselves and move to the right water depth. So you have a system that can um, self-organize or design itself. And so we tried to start thinking more along those lines. Um, but one of the things with this is it kind of, it, it's a different aesthetic. So maybe the cultural services um, that a number of different people would get out of this might be a little different because we have a different look, a different feel. Um, but we're trying to embrace the biology and the ecology that um, were maybe in this, this um, ecosystem before it became an, an urbanized ecosystem. And so finally, we can start thinking about, in terms of for stormwater management, a system that provides us all sorts of ecosystem services, because now we've got a, a, a real ecosystem that we're trying to, to create. And so one of the things that I've done is look at, just to see, if we actually do get more ecosystem services out of, say, a green type of system or an ecological-based system, such as a wetland, versus a more traditional pond. So, so sometimes you hear the phrases, um, in, in stormwater anyways, green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure. Um, so you can, this would be gray, that would be green. A pipe would be gray, bioretention would be green, those sorts of things. Oh, and we also have a hybrid system, which is where we've got a pond with some vegetation. So we'll call that green. And so I looked at a bunch of ponds and wetlands. This was in North Carolina. And looked at across, we're most interested, so a couple of services that we pinpointed were to look at biodiversity and then um, 
organic carbon, so that would be indicating that we're providing some global climate service in terms of sequestering carbon. And what we found, so when we looked at carbon in these systems, and we looked um, so across the age of these systems, so we had some that had been constructed last year to some that had been in place for 15 years, and we were interested in how was the quantity of carbon in those systems increasing over time. Because it's hard to measure um, carbon at one time because it, it, it accrues over, over many years. But basically we could collect some soil and then look at how it changed with time to get some sort of carbon accumulation rate or we were equating that with a carbon sequestration. And this is what we found. So you see our wetlands are the purple, our ponds are down here. And we did actually have a rate, a higher rate of um, increase in, in carbon. And that makes sense because we've got more vegetation in a wetland. So we've got some of that gas regulating service going on, right? Like we're pulling CO2 from the air. It's the, the plant dies, it decomposes, it sits um, in the, the anaerobic environment of the wetland soils and, and the microbes chew up some of it, but not all of it. So we get some carbon that's staying in our system. The interesting thing is when we looked at the ponds, so we looked at the ponds that had vegetation and the ones that didn't have vegetation. And we did that, we could see that we've got, or we had similar rates of carbon accumulation. So just in that area that had the vegetation. So again, seeing, well, if, even if we have maybe a not as functional pond, as, as an engineer who wants to incorporate more ecology, we could still get some in there by just um, adding a little vegetated bench. So what about biodiversity? There's a lot of things that can be living in, in believe it or not, living in stormwater ponds and wetlands, even though they receive all of the water that's running off of our, our urban landscapes. Um, but we can still have a, a pretty nice array of, of creatures living in them many ways, as well as um, the plants. And so that was a question we asked, was do we have a difference in the biodiversity, both in terms of the plants, as well as the aquatic insects or the macroinvertebrates that are um, present in these types of systems. And so if we looked at just the plants, well, this is not a surprise, right, because the wetlands have plants and most of the ponds didn't. So we had higher plant diversity in, in the wetlands. This is maybe interesting in and of itself, but again, as, as a person, um, a lot of times we're in school, well, how does this, this benefit me? And so, so maybe having a lot of different plants, you, you maybe, okay, maybe it benefits you in some way or maybe it doesn't. Certainly aesthetically it can, right? If we see different vegetation structures, different blooming plants, um, that can be, can be nice. Um, the other thing that we noticed in terms of kind of again, so from an, an engineering perspective or a designing pers perspective, if you're trying to construct these sorts of ecological systems within an urban ecosystem, if you kind of push them a little bit by giving them some plants, so giving them a palette to start from, they'll tend to be more diverse over time. Because if you just let them colonize naturally, they tended to get some of the most resistant plants or, or uh, invasive types of plants that were present and very capable of thriving in, in an urban environment. So whereas if you want some nice wetland plants and some flowering blooms, or if you wanted, say, cattails for the most part, then those, that was kind of the difference in terms of how you might think about um, managing or, or designing that sort of system from the start. Closely related to the plants were the macroinvertebrates. And so different macroinvertebrates actually have have some relationship with the plants, okay? So for instance, you can think about a dragonfly that's flying around and trying to decide where it's going to deposit its eggs that are then going to spend some time as a, as a dragonfly larvae um, in the water. And it's attracted to flowering blooms, okay? And so what we noticed was that even though in our two types of systems, we had pretty similar, actually very similar, if even not, maybe the ponds were even a little bit more diverse in terms of um, the types of macroinvertebrates that we found. We found that when we started looking at the types in terms of their functionality, so this is another way of thinking about diversity, you can think about different species or you can think about the, the functions that they're performing within that ecosystem. So we could think about what they're eating. So if they're grazing on algae or, 
a, like a mosquito larvae and, and eating detritus in the water column, or a shredder that's eating some larger particles, kind of breaking them down smaller so then the collectors get to them after that. Or if you're a predator that's eating all any of those other guys in there, we started to see some difference at that point. So in our wetlands and in our ponds with the littoral shelf, so that's the, the vegetated area, we tended to see more of these predators. So that's the area in the purple, okay? Versus our ponds where we didn't have as many predators and we tend to have more collectors. So we tend to have more, more mosquitoes, basically, is what that was. And so as a person living in an urban ecosystem, you can probably then think about some value that this biodiversity is providing. So we're getting, presumably with the predators, some pest control services, okay? There's a lot of people don't, don't care for mosquitoes, um, don't care for that piece of the biodiversity picture. Those are the, okay, yeah. So again, we had more of the, the predators, and so differences in the types of biodiversity services that we were getting out of these two um, engineered ecosystems, if you want to think of them that way. So just to, to summarize that piece, in these two types of systems, when we start thinking about um, a broader picture of ecosystem services, we can start to see that Maybe our wetland type of systems actually provide um, a, a, a bigger suite of ecosystem services, so more benefits to the communities living around them, okay? So we just looked at biodiversity and carbon sequestration, but, but you could probably think of, of other types of services that could be considered. Now really, so these are just, you know, a pond is not that big. You know, maybe, maybe it's an acre at most, maybe, or maybe you have a really large system that's 20 acres, but still, it's not huge, right? It's not your whole city that we're thinking about here. And so, this is certainly one piece. So thinking about what we can get as, as we're thinking about how to manage an ecosystem with just kind of these site-based practices. But in some ways, I find that it's not, it's not entirely fair to only think about how we can um, if for, okay, so what I'm saying is if we have a pond, but we say we want to get more ecosystem function, so we're going to put in a wetland instead. And that's great, because you do get more function. But if the rest of our ecosystem is still the same, like if we've still got the same network of, of, of pipes essentially giving the water to this system, then we haven't perhaps affected as great of a change in the capacity of that ecosystem to provide services. You see what I'm saying? So, so our, in some ways, we need, we need to think beyond just these little site, these site fixes. Because one of, the, one of the, the big pieces in terms of so greater overall, for instance, resilience to things like flooding in urban ecosystems, so this is a big concern to a lot of people, is that these little site practices, while they, while they help, they're not, they're not able, they're not big enough to provide the resilience at a city's type of scale, okay? And so I was involved with a project where we looked at not just these individual practices, but looked at, looked at the whole, what well, we called it, oh, it's a whole watershed. We looked at a watershed and then thought about what is its resilience to flooding, okay? Because we know that we're getting well around here, and this was done in Minnesota, particularly up there, um, an increasing frequency of large, large events that um, are engineered. Gray infrastructure is just, it's not able to, to handle. And the problem with wind, so for instance, a gray infrastructure system where you're just, really what you're doing is you're just conveying a flow. You have to pick the flow you wanna be able to, to transport, okay? And so if, if the flow you get is bigger, then you can be in trouble. That's what that picture is showing there, is that you don't have a lot of, of flexibility. So we looked at a couple of different urban areas, so these urban ecosystems that had different um, networks. So this is part of their hydrologic network. In most cities, this hydrologic network is comprised mainly, mainly of pipes. So whereas we may have had, before it became urbanized, maybe some, some surface flow pathways, certainly there were lots of wetlands through this area. Um, we filled those areas in so we could build houses, <laughs> and then we, we put everything in a pipe. So we, we decreased the functionality of that ecosystem in doing that, or at least that is what we su suspect we have done. So that would be the picture on your right. The other community we looked at was still 
somewhat modeling this, this sort of development pattern. But really, they had, rather than filling in wetlands, they had maintained a lot of those areas. Maybe they put in some parks and public use areas, so getting some cultural services along those wetland areas, but really maintaining some of the, the natural hydrologic integrity of this, of this watershed. So even though there's houses there, even though there's people living there and we have impervious surfaces and we, we've changed the hydrology, we haven't changed it maybe quite as much. And so to both of these study areas, we applied some different climate scenarios, okay? So we had, um, we looked at the trends and emissions, and then out of that came up with some different um, precipitation scenarios, okay? So we looked at, well, and this is the thing with, with climate, where the climate is headed or, or where, what our future precipitation is, again, we don't really know. In this protect, particular study, we came up with as little as basically no change to maybe almost, um, over a doubling of what the, the capacity that the, the stormwater system would have to be able to handle. But if we have a system that can continue functioning across this range, then we can say it's, it's pretty resilient, and that's an ecosystem service. It's, it's providing that um, disturbance regulation for us. And so those are, we modeled those storms. And basically, to get what I'm about to show you is we took those different precipitation scenarios and we put them into a hydrologic model and then out of that we were able to assess how much flooding we had, how much infrastructure was, was undersized. Um, with the flooding we could say well is it just in the street versus is it um, stacking up so it could actually be entering homes or causing some property damage, um, those sorts of things. And so if we look at those two different systems, so the one on the top is labeled Hiawatha, that was the, the densely urbanized all in a pipe system. And then our system in Victoria, which is a little more natural in terms of the hydrologic function. So you can see a couple of things. One, well, Victoria fared much better in terms of um, the overall magnitude of effects, but they still both had components that were undersized. So pieces of the, the stormwater infrastructure that had been designed that was no longer functioning. Um, and they still had flooding, both of them. But if you look at where the flooding was, so this is where that, that Flood regulation service comes in. Um, the Hiawatha system had a lot of flooding that was potentially damaging people's property, okay? Whereas in Victoria, where they had all of the kind of the vegetated, the natural ecosystems still in place, there was flooding, but the majority of it was happening in those areas or in the streets maybe. So we can, we can, we can live with street flooding and flooding in our, um, uh, park and, and wetland areas, right? So that's what, that's what the wetlands were exactly designed to do. And so if we looked at this kind of more pictorially, you can see we've got the red is where we've got some, some flooding, where we've got potentially some, some property damage coming in. So again, you can just, you can see that this system is pretty stretched in terms of just, it, it doesn't have the capacity to regulate flooding or provide that um, resilience. Whereas in Victoria, we can look at where we have water going, where the flooding's going, and, and again, it's um, not in areas that have been, that people are, are depending on to, um, as their home or, or something like that. So just to summarize, um, kind of, again, my, my perspective of how I have used ecosystem services and some of the systems um, that I have worked with, but we can, really think or, or take away from this that an ecological-based approach um, to stormwater infrastructure, or to, to you can think of it as, as managing um, water in an, in an urban ecosystem, that if we take an ecological approach, we can provide a broader suite of ecosystem services, but know that we can still provide the ones that are perhaps our, our citizenry is, is most interested in having. So they don't want to flood, and, and they probably don't want their poor water quality, but we can still do better in terms of the biodiversity. Um, we can still do better in terms of carbon sequestration. We can still do better in terms of the overall resilience of the system. We're still working though, because again, it's, it's um, somewhat difficult to, to change or to, to make decisions that um, are going to allow these practices at, at a watershed scale where you can really start to see some of the the real benefit, for instance, we saw the resilience benefit. Um, but we've made, we've made good progress, 
I think, toward um, at least getting people to embrace the idea of a more functional um, urban ecosystem. And, and hopefully throughout some of the other examples that um, we covered, you can see there's, there's lots of opportunities to use ecosystem services as, as a conceptual framework for um, addressing a problem and deciding how to move forward in a way that's going to allow you to um, not just get one benefit, but perhaps a whole lot of any, any given ecosystem that you're working in. So with that, are there, are there any questions? That's a good, that is a good point. So I think that the, in terms of stormwater and, and kind of the, the urban ecosystem picture, probably the most progress has been made where I was doing the work. So the East Coast, um, the West Coast has also made a lot of progress. The Midwest has been a little bit slower to make that progress. But part of the reason is probably because we don't have the same population density. A lot of our efforts, and so thinking about, for instance, that, that picture with, with Wichita, we have a lot of um, water quality impacts from agriculture because that's what most of our land uses are in. And so I, th I think that we have some of, some of the stormwater issues have really flown under the, the radar a little bit in some of those areas. But, um, but nationally, I think it's, it's very well accepted what we need to do, but, but doing it is another, another story. We're still, well for instance, sometimes we, just, we have people trained as, as engineers like myself, and, but we need to be working with, with other disciplines to really get a, a functional system, because there's a lot of things that we don't think about in terms of ecosystem functioning in a design that's, say, an ecologist or um, a, a plant person or anyone else would think about, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something I usually think about, but a lot of the water that we see in the streets and all that, is it directed through you know, to other places by pipe systems that we have in the cities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so it would go to like say these uh, constructed wetlands or ponds or whatever. Is that is, is that what it is happening? Yeah, and I, I should have I didn't talk about that, but yes. So where we have the ponds and the wetlands, there it rains and you've got the water on the street. There's some pipe network usually that then takes it to there. Um, Manhattan doesn't have a lot in the way, because they're a smaller community, so they haven't been um, regulated as much as some of the larger areas. So a lot of times, we'll just put it right into Campus Creek here on campus, or to Wildcat Creek, or to the Kansas River, or eventually it all gets to the Kansas River. Um, and so. So when we make the wetlands, um, is there, do the plants or the species there just kind of treat the water? Yes, yes. So, um, and that's what's really fun about the vegetation is because it's all kind of tied together. So you've got the vegetation and then they've got their roots and they're putting out good food for the, the bacteria that are living in association there. So you get lots of um, decomposition and the nutrient cycling and, and that those treatment functions happen there. A lot of them happen in the sediments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what about like uh, fossil fuels when we um, release a lot of those gases Yeah, so a lot of that part is, well, the plants will use, for instance, carbon dioxide in, in their respiration process, and so they'll incorporate it into their biomass. And then it has a, there's a couple of different options. It can either, when the plant dies, um, basically you can think a microbe eats it <laughs> and re-releases the CO2, so it gets cycled back up, or it can, or it can be trapped um, in, probably in the sediments. Um, if it's not broken down, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you for your attention. Um, I don't think we have any announcements for class other than next Tuesday you'll be here and we'll have a meeting with your advisor and your, your first round of bibliography or annotated bibliographies will be due in a week, so your first five. So if you have questions, you can ask now or Tuesday whenever. Okay, yeah.